Welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. All right. Well, it's 2.30 uh, Eastern time here. Um, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. I, I want to go ahead and kick us off and get things started. Welcome to part one of our four-part um, webinar series on a global benchmarking effort to uh, look at improving pedestrian safety on urban arterials. So this is our first webinar in a four-part series. We're really going to be today looking at um, introducing you to this project and this effort and talking about an overview of the study findings and having a little bit of discussion to kind of help queue up the series as a whole. Um, for a moment here, I've got some housekeeping items to cover, but I first wanted to introduce you to the panelists who are going to be joining us today, who we'll be hearing from. Um, so we're joined today uh, first by Sherry Schaffline um, of the Federal Highway Administration. And uh, currently as Director of the Office of Human Environment, uh, Sherry supervises three teams uh, that have responsibilities for financial oversight of uh, the office research program, advancing multimodal connectivity by addressing bicycle and pedestrian networks, mobility innovation, environmental justice and equity, community impacts, and economic development, um, accelerating project delivery through application of context-sensitive design principles, implementing the transportation alternatives, scenic byways, and active transportation infrastructure investment programs, and, and administering procedures and standards for modifying the national highway system and the strategic highway network. Uh, so we're excited to have uh, Sherry join us today. We're also joined by Dr. Laura Sant, uh, who is a research senior research associate at UNC's Highway Safety Research Center and co-director of the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center. Laura also leads the Collaborative Sciences Center for Road Safety, a national university transportation center funded under the FAST Act that focuses on advancing system-based approaches to injury prevention and health. And finally, we're joined by uh, Jonah Chiarenza, uh, who is a community planner at the USDOT Volpe National Transportation Systems Center, where he develops strategies for national policy, conducts research, and disseminates information about best practices and designs solutions for local and regional transportation challenges. Uh, so each of them were involved uh, in the study you're going to hear more about, along with many others. Um, but let me first, before we get to their presentation, just cover a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you as panelists or attendees, excuse me, won't have, have the ability to communicate with us by speaking today, but you do have the ability to ask questions, and we hope you'll do that. You can use the questions pane to send in questions, comments, any concerns you have uh, throughout the, the day, uh, and then we're going to be holding a period at the end for a Q&A discussion with our panelists, so we'll get to answer some of those at that time. Um, the webinar archive uh, is at pedbikeinfo.org slash webinars. I'll drop a more specific link in the chat in a moment where you can find a copy of the slides that are being shared today as well as a recording that we plan to post of this webinar uh, by tomorrow. Uh, so each of the uh, episodes in this series will be recorded and archived on that page. So it's one place where you can find all the information you need about this series. Um, you're gonna receive an email later today with uh, links to the archive page, as well as a place where you can provide some feedback on our webinar today. Um, that will allow you to generate, once you're done with the questions, a, a certificate of attendance so you can use that for professional development hours, reporting those. Uh, we're also, uh, we've submitted and been approved by the AICP for 1.5 CM credits for this webinar today. So if you're used to claiming those, uh, you can find it in their event calendar. Uh, as always on that same website, I encourage you to review previous web um, webinars we've done, as well as sign up for future episodes, especially in this series. I'll show you the four parts that we're planning on covering over the next couple of months. If you're signed up today, but not registered for these others, you want to make sure you go to that website and register for these sessions as well. So again, part one today, we're covering the introduction and overview. We're going to shift uh, next week to talk about the movement in place framework. In part three, we'll uh, talk more about a safe system approach to road safety audits, and then wrapping up with a discussion about speed management practices and uh, policies uh, that can help you accomplish some of those goals. So um, without further delay, I'd like to go ahead and hand things over uh, to Sherry Schaffline to kick us off. And uh, Jonah Chiarenza, uh, you can go ahead and pull your slides up whenever you're ready, and we can get right into the presentation. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Um, Representatives from the Federal Highway Administration, state and local transportation agencies, and a university participated in this study tour under the Federal Highway Global Benchmarking Program. Uh, this program serves as a tool for accessing, evaluating, and implementing proven international practices to improve highway transportation in the U.S. 
The purpose of this study was to examine noteworthy approaches and innovations used by other countries to achieve reductions in pedestrian serious injuries and fatalities on arterial roadways. The study team researched strategies from 11 peer countries in Europe, South America, and Australasia, being Australia, New Zealand, and surrounding islands, that outperformed the U.S. in pedestrian safety outcomes. Through a desk review and using six criteria to evaluate the countries, those criteria being policy, planning, design, technology, data, and context, the study team determined that the countries with the best combination of innovative practices demonstrated success in improving pedestrian safety over time and context similarity were New Zealand and Australia. Our study team provided, uh, let's go back to the previous slide there, uh, Jonah. Our study team provided a multidisciplinary perspective from fields including engineering, planning, safety, health, and environmental protection. Um, also joining us today are Tamara Redman uh, uh, from our Office of Safety Technology at Federal Highways. She's the Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety Program Manager. Lee Austin is with us today as City Traffic Engineer from the City of Austin, and she represented NACTO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials. And Rachel Carpenter from uh, Caltrans, who's the Chief Safety Officer, and Mark Cole, who's the State Traffic Operations Engineer. Uh, and uh, for safety engineering operations at the Virginia DOT. Uh, both of these folks uh, representing states represented uh, AASHTO member uh, states as well. And Darren Buck, who was unable to travel, but he has provided pre and post trip support to the team. Um, so all those folks except Rachel are with us today and we'll, we'll bring them on at the back end to help answer any questions. You need to know that we had to divide uh, our focus on duties, uh, be give, given the large number of people at our meetings and the breadth of topics we were covering in one week with jet lag and a packed uh, schedule. Uh, so uh, we hope uh, if we have any of our folks from New Zealand and Australia who've gotten up at the crack of dawn, let us know and we'll try to uh, get you in on the Q&A at the back end as well. Okay, next slide. So I really encourage you right now to, uh, you see the links, uh, open up uh, the reports. Uh, the white cover report is the desk audit and the report with the graph is the final report. Uh, so you can uh, follow along and zoom in on any charts, tables and graphics that interest you. The report's about 95 pages and it really includes a robust reference list for all the resources mentioned in the report. And of course that QR code will get you to our international page, uh, landing page, and you can scroll down to see this uh, content as well. So I'd ask you to please make notations on questions you have or clarifications that are needed. With this session, we'll make sure attendees have a good overview of the findings and um, questions that really require expanded discussion, further graphics, or uh, more details on case studies We'll try to work those into the upcoming uh, webinar series sessions. There's a lot of rich content. So the team was very deliberate in setting up this four part webinar series. So we could really help US practitioners, academics and advocates fully understand what is it gonna to take to address our pedestrian fatality crisis. Our report cover was very intentional and designed to make a bold statement. Our ubiquitous urban arterials that serve as a road for throughput cannot also serve as a street for use by people of all ages and abilities that want or need to walk and bike along or across those arterials to get where they wanna go. Our fatalities are trending up while Australia and New Zealand are trending down. Next slide. Let's look at these uh, numbers in detail here uh, with a couple of charts. The chart one, you can see that 45% more pedestrians were killed in the US in 2019 than in 2010. The UK at the same time saw a 17% increase between 2010 and 2019. 
Over the same interval, all other peer countries experienced relatively stable or dropping figures. The total number of fatalities vary in scale largely based on each country's population. However, the trend shown over the past two decades clearly illustrates a stark difference in performance between the US and study peers. On chart two, this graph shows the same data, but as a percentage of each country's 2000 fatality count. So it shows how the number of fatalities has changed relative to, to the year 2000. So as of 2010 and 2019, all countries except, except the US demonstrated an overall downward trend between 2000 and 2019. And as of our 2021 estimates, uh, the US numbers are uh, off the charts and over 70% more pedestrians were killed on US roadways in 2021 than 2010. And the ped fatalities are increasing at nearly three times the rate of all other roadway fatalities since 2010. 2010, we had uh, 28,697 non-ped fatalities. And in 21, we had 35,573 non-ped fatalities. Next slide. So we, the, the whole realm of safety is a lot to cover. We tried to really focus on uh, principal and minor arterials where for the US, it's about 52% of all fatal crashes and about 60% of all the fatal pedestrian crashes. Um, we are still building roads that try to be streets, but prioritize vehicle speed and throughput at the expense of pedestrian access, convenience, and safety. Uh, our arterials are part street, a place, a complex environment where urban life happens. We can think about pedestrians, bikes, bus stops, buildings that address sidewalks, entrance and exits to and from street, and with spaces for temporary parking and delivery vehicles. Our arterials are part road, a high speed connection between places with wide lanes, limited bike, ped, and transit infrastructure minimal building frontage, vehicle-oriented entrances and exits. So many of our arterials do not function well as either a street or a road. The design and operation of many arterials emphasize speed and traffic flow, as well as commerce and access to goods and services. Arterials that try to be all things to all people is ending up both being, uh, can end up failing as it is. And, the stats that we're looking at for 22 are not looking any better. Next slide. So I, we know what to do to prevent pedestrian fatalities on urban arterials. In fact, we know what to do on all road types. Reduce the vehicle speed to mitigate the kinetic energy. We know how to use geometric design and operational strategies and new technologies and camera enforcement. We know we need to separate vulnerable road users from motorized vehicles in time and space. You're, you're not gonna survive a hit if you're not. We know how to design roads and streets to suit uh, the desired context. We know how to consider future land use, um, economic uh, needs, climate needs, public health and equity goals. Much of what we're talking here Federal highways is worked into our complete streets uh, design model as a default design model, which states a complete street design model includes careful consideration of measures to set and design for appropriate speeds, separation of various users in time and space, improvement of connectivity and access for pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit riders, including people with disabilities, and implementation of safety countermeasures. We collectively agreed that we didn't see anything that none of us have ever thought of uh, before on this trip. You know, sure there were minor variations on a theme, but the big take home was how. How are the, these countries doing the all the above approach to bring down the numbers? So to answer that question, it requires a look upstream from the countermeasures, signs, and lines. 
they have found ways to integrate policy, planning, and design to easily roll out standard business practices. Next slide. The Australasian uh, transportation policy has centered on the safe system approach for over two decades, beginning with Australia's national road safety strategy back in 2001. Since that time, Australian and New Zealand transportation agencies at the federal, state, and municipal level have developed increasingly sophisticated and coordinated policies, strategies, and laws to aggressively improve transportation access and safety, especially for pedestrians. They have flipped the model. Pedestrian movement is the foundation of transportation. It is the most elemental form of access to opportunity. Transportation systems need to prioritize pedestrians and are shaped by policies and laws that put human well being at the center of the policy goals. The policies uh, are multi-benefit outcome. They can focus on safety, efficient and sustainable movement of people and goods rather than movement of vehicles. And they can more objectively balance multimodal access and mobility to achieve the best societal outcomes. Simply stated, they have moved away from autocentric auto transportation planning. Next slide. And this is where I really need every planner in attendance to listen up. We will not move our fatality trend downwards till we take a network scale approach that considers how transportation system, the system can advance many societal goals rather than narrowly serve motor vehicle transportation. The movement in place planning framework that we're gonna to introduce to you and its process can serve as that link between policymaking and the design and implementation of transportation projects. We can address safety, equity, climate, and economic challenges uh, through uh, understanding the role that land use plays in contextualizing the priorities for transportation movement. The movement in place planning framework can help break the cycle of self-reinforcing auto-oriented land use and transportation projects. The framework incorporates walking, rolling, cycling, freight, public transit, in addition to motor vehicles traffic. This also broadens the definition of transportation network to include off-street routes like multi-use paths that can serve as an important uh, non-motorized transportation link. Place in this context means private or public development, residential, commercial, industrial, institutional, civic, and other uses. Place also refers to land use density, architectural design, and urban design, including the design and function of the public realm around buildings and public spaces. Next slide. These countries have fully integrated context-sensitive design and practitioner roles are aligned. Transportation planners, traffic engineers, urban planners, and urban designers have evolved a common framework for describing the functions of roads and streets, and they have a common language to link planning and design. Geometric and operational design guidance is spelled out for each context classification. They can now accelerate and scale improvements as there is a general consensus on the approach between levels of government at the local, regional, and national level. Communities can now effectively address discrete transport, they cannot effectively address discrete transportation issues like safety, equity, public health, congestion, freight, and, and isolation. Sustainable solutions to all these issues really require uh, analytical tools and the multidisciplinary practitioners who can work outside of their silos to analyze the trade-offs between different modal emphasis uh, through a rational and systemic approach. Now I'm gonna hand off to Laura for more details on the seamless approach to policy planning and design for these safety outcomes. Thank you, Sherry. 
And I really just want to layer on to what Sherry has just introduced as, as some really fundamental concepts and reinforce things um, so that folks might be able to hear it more than one time. Because we realize that we're talking about complicated issues that are very entangled. And we're gonna do our best to sort of lay them out in a discreet way that folks um, following this series can really um, capture and, and understand. Um, so Sherry already talked about some of the elements of the safe system approach and how important it is to integrate policy planning and design. And this was just one visual example that we identified from New South Wales that really helps to emphasize that system aspect of how their organization um, applies these concepts. The principles and the goals that are established in their vision are really carried throughout the entire process in a continuous learning cycle that feeds back into itself to help continue the move and the shift away from more car centric and less safe, high risk, high speed environments um, to uh, delivering safety outcomes that really help meet those community goals. And the policies and the plans are very closely tied to those design practices and standards. Next slide, please, Jonah. In the US, I think we often think about these areas of transportation uh, professions and activities um, in very discrete bends. You know, we have folks that are working on policy, folks working on planning, uh, programming and, and uh, prioritizing projects, and then folks that do the design and delivery of the actual projects and the evaluation. Um, and so we recognize that there are these big discrete areas of work that are happening in the US, and we wanted to organize our report to cover those major areas. Um, at that same time, we wanted to make the connection to folks reading this report to see how the safe system principles can be applied in each of these areas, and how there's a principle, maybe all many principles that could um, be really leveraged in these different actions taken by different agencies. And we also recognize that many communities in the U.S. have already been talking for a long time about safe systems, uh, concepts, applications, what it looks like in practice. And folks have identified a lot of barriers, whether it's a policy barrier, other institutional barriers, issues around workforce or misalignment. Um, we know that there's a lot of challenges and gaps, and this slide has a lot of information on it, but really it's intended to just show you a high-level snapshot of what we try to cover in our report and really um, showcase how the different work that we're doing in the U.S. Um, can be approved upon and can have some very direct applications of these safe system principles in practice that might help us um, overcome some issues that have kept us from reducing our pedestrian fatalities in the past. The other thing that our project team wanted to do was really make sure that our findings could be relatable to the US context, because we recognize that when folks go overseas, it's often questioned whether or not those findings can still be applicable in different cultures and contexts. And so as we organized the report, we wanted to draw a clear connection to um, not only the activities that happen in the US in terms of transportation planning and project delivery, um, but where there is a key product or a deliverable that an agency produces, um, where this might be an opportunity to apply the lessons from this report. And in this webinar series, we tried to bundle some of the insights from the report into three specific practice areas. Um, the movement in place framework, uh, which is what we'll cover in the October 2nd webinar. The roadway safety audit processes, uh, which is what we'll cover in the October 23rd webinar. And then speed management practices, which will be in our November 7th webinar. And each of these concepts, these practice areas, is, as you can see, very interconnected, very cross-cutting. Um, but we see these as three key opportunities to operationalize a system approach to pedestrian safety. 
And we recognize that some folks may have only a very small role in one of these areas. You may have your work focused on long range transportation planning or updating design standards, and you may not have a role in all of these different areas. But the more that you're able to see this holistic approach and the interconnected system, the more you may be able to connect and develop um, common language, common uh, collaborations, uh, partnerships that might really enhance and de-silo the work that's happening uh, in your agency. And so backing up again, we um, had the entire project uh, really scoped broadly um, to help us cover many different areas that we were interested in learning about from these other countries. Um, but ultimately our report and this series really highlights um, three core areas of policy planning and design. And I will cover a little bit more on some of the four key policy takeaways um, that Sherry has alluded to, and then I'll hand it over to Jonah to talk a little bit more about the planning and design. So one of the first takeaways from um, our review of the existing policies and approaches that we, we learned about from our peers in uh, New Zealand and Australia, was really how safety is part of a holistic approach. Uh, the goal of safety is not really just to prevent deaths and injuries, but there's so many other interconnected benefits of prioritizing safety. And this comes from making clear connections to how safety is related to climate change, to mode shift, as well as intermodal planning. And what we saw is how really safety in these other, um, these other documents um, was very much framed as a way to achieve health and sustainability and these other um, community and national priorities. So for example, mode shift away from car centric roadway design uh, was not only seen as a way to uh, reduce environmental impacts and improve health, it was really seen and, and described as a safety approach by which uh, we can reduce exposure to even the possibility of a crash when we reduce the need and the requirement to drive higher speed, uh, heavier vehicles. Uh, and so that was, I think, a really important um, takeaway. And we're seeing with the bipartisan infrastructure law, more multi-objective programs and outcomes here in the US. Um, and it, it's really uh, exciting and, uh, I think gives us um, optimism about the movements in the US uh, to really identify safety as the foundation uh, to achieve many other policy goals. The second P, uh, key policy takeaway that we describe in the report is um, that clear connection between policy and specific measurable targets that can help evaluate progress and performance in reaching a policy goal. So what we were seeing when you, when you saw the previous slide, it had um, four key strategic priorities. When you dive further into that document, you see those are very clearly linked to specific outcomes that they're looking to have, as well as measurable indicators. And in the US, we often see indicators such as death and serious injuries as um, not only used to identify baseline conditions, but to set safety targets. But in these countries that we were able to visit, we saw folks going much further and not just focusing on those kind of lagging outcome indicators, um, but also looking at more interim metrics, more of those what you might call leading indicators that would help um, showcase what agencies are doing and putting in place to reduce exposure to a crash, to reduce the risk or the severity of a crash, and ultimately predict a reduction in that outcome of interest, such as deaths and severe injuries. So just to give you an example from New South Wales, um, here's a chart that shows the change in fatalities from 1970 to 2020. And you can see a pretty strong reduction uh, in the numbers um, over that time period. And in the last 20 years, uh, since 2000, there has been a really big focus on speed management. And so what we see in this is that the agency is not just measuring 
uh, the number of total fatalities um, that have changed since that policy was initiated, they're looking at interim metrics as well. They're looking at issues such as, you know, what proportion of urban roads have changed to have lower speeds or what intersections have been designed at a speed limit that can really produce energy levels that can the human body can tolerate in the event of a crash. And they're looking at what share of vehicles are compliant with the speed limit or the design speed on different roadways. And so going beyond just those lagging indicators to measuring their actions and how they might produce um, safer outcomes is really an embedded practice that we identified in these countries. The third policy takeaway we had was just around the nature of these policies and the, the target setting and measurement um, being aligned at the state and local levels, uh, as well as at the federal level. Um, so this is an example in New Zealand we saw really coordinated efforts across state and local levels where local area plans, land use efforts, policies really reflected those national goals and helped to institutionalize um, priorities that were related to safety and taking an intermodal network approach even down to you know, the small area and the, the urban um, core of different cities that were uh, throughout the country. And part of the tool that supported that, sorry, Jonah, I'm still one slide back. Um, part of, of the tool that we're gonna talk about a little bit more is that movement in place framework. And these kinds of safe system tools are really helping with that integration from different agency levels, helping with that coordination and having a unified vision, a unified set of um, tools and data to help move them into addressing some of their um, roadway network issues. Okay, ready for the next slide. So the fourth policy takeaway that we share is also very much related to the topic of one of our future webinars. And it's that of how do we uh, use policy to move safety planning further upstream. And this example shows um, kind of a complicated uh, look at how a systemic approach is taken in um, some of the Austro's guidance for implementing road safety audits. But if you look at the, the red square in the far right corner, those reactive techniques um, where there's crash data analysis, at scene crash assessments, crash investigations, those are the traditional road safety audit approaches that we're seeing in the US that are most commonly used. And what was so unique in the places that we were able to visit was how further upstream they have gone in the network and corridor planning and program development and scoping phase, way pre-construction to think about safety and embed safety considerations and different partners that bring multimodal and multidisciplinary safety expertise into that process. And so road safety audits in, in the countries we visited are really an opportunity to deliver on safety policy goals. And so we are going to be featuring this topic more in our webinar number three. So that's what I wanted to cover in terms of policy. And now I'm gonna hand it back over to Jonah to keep us moving in the discussion around planning. Great, thank you, Laura. Uh, so I will focus on planning and design, the latter two parts of our, um, of our, our report. Um, and this was, I'll have to say, this was really the aha moment for us when we were doing the desk review and discovered um, movement in place. It's not like nobody in the states had ever talked about um, land use and transportation. You know, as we well know, that's that's a topic that's been in discussion for years. And as Sherry said at the beginning, we kind of know what to do in most contexts. The real question is, how do we get it done? And for us, the movement in place framework really is that sort of um, kind of amazing new thing um, that we're excited about sharing with all of our U.S. practitioner friends because it is a tool or a strategy or a framework to operationalize the linking of land use and transportation. And I think what's really crucial to understand is that neither of these things sort of exist in stasis. 
land use changes over time, and it's directed in part by zoning and by land use planning that considers, you know, the ongoing evolution of that built environment um, around our transportation networks. And likewise, transportation networks change over time. And we've seen roads get bigger. We've started to see, see roads get smaller with road diets um, or have their uh, right of way sort of redistributed among different modes. And the process of matching that future land use change to future roadway change is really hard. It's really, really hard because we as practitioners in one or the other of these fields only have sort of control over a small portion of it. And so again, what the movement in place framework does is it establishes a, a process for planning that considers future land use and a future transportation network and designs them to, to be rolled out in sequence over time as those opportunities present themselves because land use changes, you know, due to private investment or, or a public investment, or because the road needs to be resurfaced and it's an opportunity to change the striping. Um, those opportunities can be capitalized on and rather than scrambling at the last minute to try to figure out what the design should be on a given corridor where a project is going to exist, we can have a more continuous streamless process that links those policy goals to the planning process and the programming of projects that can realize those changes over time incrementally as those projects um, come up. And so to get into a little bit more detail about how the movement in place framework works. Um, there's sort of two layers to it. The first is to establish modal priorities at a network scale. And so you can see in the diagram at the right, um, there are public transport uh, corridors, general traffic corridors, freight corridors, and cycle and micromobility corridors. And these are corridors that you know provide important roles in circulating people by those modes or goods by those modes where investment in that particular mode on that particular corridor is linked to the land uses that that corridor either travels through or between. The other aspect to this is to identify the movement and place characteristic of each segment of these networks, the, the networks identified here, but really any network, including much smaller streets, and say, how much movement significance is there on this section of a given corridor? And how much place significance is there on this section of a given corridor? And where does that put me in a matrix where I can see how I need to balance the priorities of moving people through or across and among a corridor and how much I wanna accommodate the place or the character um, and the activities that happen on that corridor at a smaller, more, more human scale. Here are two more examples of um, versions of the movement in place framework. Um, that are used in this this version is called the one network framework um, and it's actually only showing the urban portion of it there's also a, a rural portion from the country of New Zealand and then this is showing the movement in place framework from Auckland the city and from New South Wales the state in Australia and I'm going to show examples of two different types of arterials from um, Australia that connect again those policy goals to a planning process that then links to design guidance that tells you what to put where on the segment. And again, the goal here is not to have sort of a scramble and, and sort of a, a fight block by block to change the cross section of a street, but to have a more thoughtful long-term process that says, here's the priority for our society on this corridor. And here's what the design should look like to facilitate that. And it might change. It might change from one section of a corridor to the next based on the changing context um, of, that, of that section of the corridor. And that, that's important. Um, so here's an example of a connector avenue. This is um, a Google Street View image from 2009, I think, showing um, a four lane cross section with a sidewalk on both sides. The uh, outside lanes used for parking, uh, the inside lanes for travel, just a straight shot road um, with industrial and warehouse uses along the corridor. Now it was determined that this corridor has important freight, uh, cycling and micromobility, and transit priority. 
So three things that had to be wedged in into this corridor. Uh, and the design that they come up with, and this, this example, this street is pulled right out of the New South Wales design guidance document, their design standards manual, um, is to say, we're gonna prioritize pedestrians and um, access to transit by having uh, bus boarding islands. We're gonna prioritize micromobility and, and cycling by having a two-way cycle track. This is a corridor where access to the destinations along the corridor is not particularly important for cyclists. It's more of a through route. Um, and so kind of consolidating that portion of the right of way to one side of the street, making more efficient use of the buffer by only having it on one side of the street makes sense. Um, prioritizing vehicle movement is important as well. And in this case, you know, to fit the, the transit island in and allow the bus to pull over and uh, have passengers alight or, or, uh, or board um, cause them to remove the parking on both sides of the street to provide a continuous vehicle throughput here so that they're not holding up the freight on this corridor. So again, this is a way to think about the priorities at a modal scale and the local context of this portion of the corridor and then implement designs that best facilitate that type of movement and place that you want on the corridor while recognizing the sort of regional network significance um, or modal significance of this corridor. And further down the corridor, we can see some other design elements. Again, none of this is stuff that you've never seen in the States, right? It's just about how do you get the organizations that put these, these projects together to understand where to do what. Um, here we have edge islands and a concrete barrier to sort of constrain people's um, driving to the, the lanes so that they have to interact with these um, speed cushions to, to mitigate speed because there's nothing really in the corridor from a design perspective to mitigate speed based on the, the geometry. It's just a straight shot. And as we saw at the previous slide, the bus boarding island is, is uh, the, the traffic is allowed to move around the bus boarding island. The, the bus doesn't stop in the lane. Um, so we need this kind of speed management technique um, to help mitigate speeds. We also need to protect um, cyclists. So the, the cycling um, facility is protected by a raised concrete curb. And then where the vehicles are expected to cross the path of the cyclists, we've got you know signage and the green paint for conspicuity to help alert cyclists and motorists um, to that potential for conflict so that there's, there's uh, a better adherence to um, safety practices when turning across the cycle track. Another example um, is a principal arterial road. So this is an example of less of a road diet and more of a road expansion. And you know we st still see projects like this all over the country in the States. This is a rural corridor where a lot of planned use development was envisioned and circulating people between those planned developments and business districts um, is something that they wanted to accommodate and we're gonna to have to accommodate with more vehicle traffic, but also more transportation, more transit traffic and um, bicycling, um, uh, sort of multimodal cycling uh, and micromobility traffic. And so they turned this two lane rural road with these very, it almost looks like a four lane here, these, these very long on and off um, ramp-ish lanes to pull in and out of the, the corridors that would go down into the farmland. And that has now become a six lane cross section with four lanes of general purpose traffic and then a bus only lane um, and a side running um, shared use path. And the speed management techniques used in this, because this corridor you know, has flow and, and a high volume of movement and vehicle-based movement at that um, as one of its core roles in the network, that speed is managed by mobile speed cameras. Um, and the the design of the facility for uh, bus riders allows the the bus traffic to stop here um, at the entrances to the planned developments and connects those planned developments through multi-use paths out to the bus stations providing um, really high quality um, pedestrian safety uh, in accessing and, and crossing this this um, corridor and little design flourishes. This is this is backwards because we're in New Zealand here, but or in Australia. Um, you can see the the on-ramp 
here or the, the off ramp from the arterial to get onto the local access road um, positions the crosswalk at a, a direct line of sight to the driver and only has the driver turn into the um, local access lane after they've passed the crosswalk. Um, or here, you know, they're offsetting the crosswalk towards the direction of travel um, to make sure that pedestrians and, and motorists are engaging one another and making sure that the, the motorists are stopping for pedestrians enter the crosswalk. Um, so little design elements like that are really specifically emphasized for this type of facility with this type of multimodal access um, that's desired. And now I'm just going to quickly run through a couple of other examples of the types of design elements that we saw. Um, again, areas where they just categorically reduce the speed. And we see this in the states, folks reducing their speed limits to 25 miles an hour in urban areas, um, indicating that red light speed cameras are in, in force or um, or uh, red light and speed cameras are in force and indicating activities uh, or areas of high pedestrian activity. Um, we also saw a lot of um, modal separation. So using vertical elements to separate um, pedestrians and bicyclists and micromobility users from other um, motorized road users. Um, we saw the creation of a more pleasant, enjoyable urban experience with vegetation and other physical um, urban design barriers or buffers between uh, cyclists and, and micromobility users and pedestrians and the, the motor vehicles on higher speed streets. And we also saw um, oh, another examples of that modal separation. We saw several examples of shared zones where just dropping the speed limit down to 10 kilometers an hour, um, which is a crawl, and having sort of free rein access for pedestrians and, and cyclists um, cues to the, the travelers in that area of the type of behavior that is expected um, and the type of um, access to urban areas and destinations ad adjacent to those areas um, that are desired for the kind of place um, the planners want for you know more downtown or, or town center type type locations. We also saw a lot of um, vertical deflection. So rather than having um, roadways uh, cross at, at grade um, the, the pedestrian and bicycle realm, we see the pedestrian and bicycle realm kind of maintain its grade and motor vehicle users having to go up onto that grade um, through a, a vertical deflection um, sort of communicates and, and telegraphs to drivers that they're entering another space where they are, are not prioritized and they need to yield. Similar uh, examples here. Of raised crosswalks. Good, uh, that's it for planning and design, but again, tune in for the Movement in Place um, webinar, which is coming up next, and I will pass it off to Sherry to um, take us home. Okay, we should have plenty of time for questions. So, um, as, as you know, next week, we're gonna continue the four-part series, and I'm sure as you've been listening, you're already starting to translate these findings to local, state, or national initiatives and policy and design guidance updates that are within your zone of influence that you're thinking about. Um, we will delve uh, much deeper into the resources, the data, process, and measures being used to operationalize uh, movement in place, the road safety audits, and speed management, and we'll highlight some more examples in the future. Please know that the team has a responsibility to develop an implementation plan for the findings and make a surge effort over the next two years to promote awareness of the findings and uptake. So uh, we will be offering in these upcoming sessions um, some of our ideas on the opportunistic areas that are presenting themselves at the federal and state level to uh, insert some of these findings. Uh, we will discuss uh, where further research may be needed, and we'll solicit uh, input from you all on obstacles that might need to be addressed and carrots that might be needed uh, in um, kickstarting uh, pilot efforts and expanding what's going on in the United States. We do have some research funds in the upcoming fiscal year to support implementation through tools, resources, or pilots, so we 
really request your feedback on what you're hearing and might need to uh, implement this work. So please promote the webinars uh, within your organization and within your colleagues so we can keep this dialogue going. Next slide. We do hope that people will meet this moment of pedestrian fatality crisis with leadership and innovation now. There are a myriad of federal discretionary and formula programs um, that will fund much of what we've gone over today. Our division offices, our subject matter experts at headquarters and on our resource center can provide um, direct technical assistance, or we can point you to a large body of growing online technical assistance to take advantage of all these funds that are highlighted in the light blue. So don't, don't wait for everything. There's lots of resources that get going right now, particularly with safety and safety planning and implementing what we've talked about. Okay, I think we're ready to move into the Q&A on the next slide. And um, Dan, if you can offer us, uh, we hope we've been kind of lumping and splitting questions as they've come in. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks for all your presentations first. A lot of really valuable information there. We'll keep the slides up because we may want to refer back and forth. Uh, we got a lot of really good questions. And I will say as we get into these, you know, we have the remaining episodes coming up, parts two, three, and four. And if we don't reach all the questions now uh, that are some on, on some of these detailed uh, items, we'll be cataloging those, saving them for those future sessions, probably even sharing them with the panelists who will be preparing those presentations to maybe hope, hopefully they can work that in. So if we don't answer your question today, uh, we hope we will get to it soon. Um, I wanted to kind of start high level, and I'm not sure who is the best one to kind of kick this one off. Um, but, you know, Sherry, at the beginning, you shared some of those statistics about rising and trends and fatalities in the United States um, among different road users. And uh, there were some questions about how similar have the safety trends been in some of these other countries that were looked at for the study tour. There were also some other questions um, uh, sub, sub related to that about, do they have similar issues related to over-representation among certain racial or ethnic groups or uh, those with socioeconomic status um, how, how do those kind of issues may relate on an equity uh, lens to, to what we see in the U.S.? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the second one. Jonah, do you want to maybe pull some things from the, uh, the the death study that was done on the comparisons? Sure. And I can speak a little bit to the data in terms of um, some of the, the trends in these other countries. I know we looked at some of the World Health Organization and World Bank data to look at how the US compares to New Zealand and some of its health outcome indicators. And what we saw was that um, in New Zealand, they had um, you know, much lower rates of overdose and drug-related deaths. They had lower rates of suicide mortality um, and lower rates of exposure to CO2 emissions and higher general rates of life expectancy. So we know that population health as a whole was a little bit better in some of these other countries. Um, but at the same time, we did see that alcohol consumption was actually higher in these other two countries. Um, so we did see some you know, behavioral and cultural differences as well as similarities in terms of the, the health side of the data. On, on working with the Maori and the um, Aboriginals in Australia, um, in New Zealand, they were very deliberate um, about honoring the Maori. We started every meeting with a Maori introduction and acknowledging the land that we were on. And they have very much worked it into their, uh, their concerns into the public involvement process. They pay for involvement and they have seats at the table for Maori representatives in the communities where they're doing work to um, express their needs and interests. And I, I don't recall that we saw specific data on disproportionate impacts. I think we, we heard some stories and some examples of uh, uh, in both countries about challenges with uh, walking along the roadsides and um, other socioeconomic issues that are 
uh, can exacerbate some of the safety problems. And so they are both trying to work at um, basically bringing in the indigenous folks into their public involvement process and um, being very respectful of their uh, participation and their needs at uh, designing um, uh, and accommodating their needs at the local level. And through, say, and through transit as well. Yeah. Um, part of the solution is to have the appropriate accommodation. Like Sherry was saying, walking along a roadway in a rural environment, having a separate path where you have the right of way and you can provide a separate path that has access to bus stops, but isn't forcing people to walk along or wait directly along a, a high speed rural road um, are part of you know, implementing the design guidance for that character of, of place along a corridor um, or slowing the movement, um, the speed down on the approach to places where you're going to be expecting crossings again in a rural environment. Um, we also heard, for example, you know, uh, New South Wales, or maybe Australia overall had pretty stringent um, fines for people driving. And while we were there, the, the Queen had recently died. And so all of Australia was on holiday for Thursday and they had um, signs up saying double points double demerits basically is what they said on the corridor and they would you know basically say we're gonna use automated enforcement or camera-based enforcement because we don't have as many people out on the road patrolling um we expect lower volumes of vehicles therefore speeds may be higher so we're going to use our technology to try to combat that and our policy approach to really disincentivize speeding in this environment and then on top of that from an equity perspective they were saying However, you know, it, that means that it could be pretty easy to lose your license in Australia and New Zealand or have it taken away for a period of time. And they had very um, purposefully integrated programs to help people regain their license if having access to a vehicle was important for their livelihood, but to do so with training um, such that they would be become safer drivers when they got back behind the wheel, uh, rather than just purely penalizing people um, who might not have a lot of other options for getting access to opportunity. Um, I, I had a question too about, um, you know, in general, this came up, uh, I think one of our registrants asked this before the webinar, um, in terms of the study tour and, and selecting these countries in particular, what what led you to Australia and New Zealand? I covered some of this at the beginning, if we can re review it a bit. Um, what led you to, to these countries among the many others that I think have been subjects of study tours in the past to so some European countries and, and others. Um, why, why the focus here on Australasia? Yeah, are you seeing the, the slide or the, the page from the, the desk yes. review? Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, this is, none of this is completely bulletproof, right? But in general, we found that Australia and New Zealand had this most similar context in terms of, you know, central business districts and surrounding sort of suburban, but urbanizing areas that most similarly um, reflect the type of land use and transportation character and context that we have in the states and some of the challenges. And so we felt like, you know, looking at other European examples, the just the, <clears throat> the characteristics and the age of their cities mm -hmm. um, and their development patterns were different. And so their strategies and solutions for pedestrian safety were different. And Australia and New Zealand provided the best match. Along those lines, speaking of sort of the um, land development and land uses, um, the and the final report, you know, we're kind of focusing some attention in the title, at least on urban arterials, and um, wonder to what degree you think the findings broadly from what we're going to learn about in this series could be applicable to not only urban areas but also suburban and even rural areas in the U.S. Um, are there are there lessons for all contexts? One hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> Great. We will uh, we'll encourage then everyone to keep uh, stay tuned because uh, you'll hear something no matter where so you're working. One of the things we heard and what we saw, obviously, were in the urban areas because that's where we had time to go on the trip. But mm -hmm. everyone assured us that, um, you know, everyone in New Zealand comes to uh, their capital city. Right. So their thinking was if we can show people what we're talking about. Right. They're going to take it back and it'll seem doable and applicable and scalable in other parts of the country. And you'll you'll certainly see with our future webinars when we talk about road safety audits that process can work with 
any type of project in any context. The process around speed management has very specific context considerations when it gives the speed guidance ranges. And it certainly covers rural as well as suburban and urban um, roadway types. And I think even the movement in place framework, um, while, while we were looking at more of those urban and urban fringe uh, case examples, we certainly saw the, that it's a network level approach to the planning. And what's really different is what those specific you know, design options might look like when you drill into their design standards when you consider more rural contexts and what the speed and land use around that road is. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, I wanted to touch on the movement in place framework because there were some questions there and some even some uh, folks offering some examples of, you know, haven't I heard about this before? This may, may be a subject of this paper that maybe came out a couple of years, you know, a couple of decades ago. And it seems like it's something that an idea that's been around, but but just hasn't maybe taken hold in the U.S. as it has in Australasia. And, and Sherry, you hinted at this, too, that a lot of these ideas maybe aren't new, but they're uh, in need of some uh, re renewal and, and getting them back into the conversation and real motivation to implement. So I wonder if you could speak to the movement in place framework in particular and maybe where that might trace its origins and, and whether that's some, been something that's been around in the U.S. It's just not been front of mind for many transportation planners and engineers. Yeah, I'll add some comments, but I'm I'm sure, and I would appreciate the the rest of the panelists. Feel free to turn on uh, uh, your your uh, cameras and join us in this discussion. We we've worked on context sensitive design for over 20 years, right? We had a big rollouts, and we moved from you know design and defend towards looking at all the socioeconomic, environmental, multimodal context, and um, try to collaborate and build the best solution for environmental benefit, you know, uh, reducing conflicts and uh, aiding environmental streamlining at the time. And, and, and everyone kind of got the context and we did pilots and pushed all that out, right? Um, at the same time, we were, either Congress was telling us or we were promoting, we need uh, bike and pedestrian plans. We need uh, transit plans. We need uh, goods, moving goods uh, plans and freight plans. And we haven't quite got there, I think, to stack all of that in a coherent planning and process that then says, how have we embedded safety and started to program and prioritize uh, the land use side around that? So we do it in bits and pieces, but it never quite has come together and appreciate other th other uh, thoughts on that. I think that's a good insight, Sherry. And I think one of the challenges in the US is the scale at which we're working. We do have to acknowledge that New Zealand has roughly 5 million people and New South Wales where we were has you know a population of 8 million. Um, we're talking about a much smaller land area, much smaller population, smaller number of agencies. And I think that just makes the scaling and the coordination much more challenging in the US to stack all of those plans and have that unified approach across so many different entities. On that on that topic, Laura, the coordination, um, there, there are some questions about how, how similar um, these countries are in terms of the way they have juris maybe jurisdictional issues over roadway ownership that maybe in say in the US, uh, we may have a local agency in the state who are needing to come together for a certain corridor that might be state owned, but in a local community say, and I'm wondering about how that typically plays out, um, the relationship between the municipality, the state, uh, the central government and how that, how that works. Jonah, you've got one network framework open. I know, but I've been talking a lot. I was curious if one of our panelists wanted to chime in. I just, uh, this is Darren Buck. Uh, I just wanted to add very quickly that um, uh, there's currently a large NCHRP project in process, 07-29, uh, uh, that is updating the very influential uh, Ashto uh, 
well, let me read off the official name, a policy on geometric design for, for highways, uh, otherwise known as the Green Book, uh, to create the eighth edition of the Green Book. Um, and that uh, project is placing an emphasis on context uh, sensitive design and coming up with the design parameters um, that uh, does consider where a project takes place, what the needs are, uh, what the, well, frankly, what the adjacent land uses are. Um, that is not, uh, doesn't necessarily go to the sort of policy driven linkage between land use uh, and street design, but uh, is at least getting us towards um, considering context. And so that project is well underway and we hope that uh, this narrative can help uh, sort of um, help impact uh, the direction of, of how that is going. Uh, so that is NCHRP, I can place a, uh, a link to that project so people know that it is happening in the chat. Thank you, Darren. Darren, I wonder if you, yeah, you had any comments on that, that point on the jurisdictional collaboration, you know, bottlenecks issues that may come arise with, with shared ownership of certain corridors. Yeah. So for the, on the movement in place webinar um, next week, we're going to have um, two practitioners, one from the city of Auckland um, and sort of somebody who's overseen the process of developing the modal priorities for that corridor or those corridors. And that's we're going to be able to like do two things and jump to that page of the report. Um, but the. Yeah, this. But then the. And then we'll also have somebody from the country, um, Waka Katai, um, New Zealand Transit um, Authority, and that um, those groups have worked kind of in in coordination. Again, wonderful example of inner governmental coordination, where the way um, the the country's one network framework has worked is sort of to provide. Um, the like what we would what would be equivalent to like our non metropolitan and statewide planning, because New Zealand is about as big as a state and then the metropolitan or like you know. regional sub regional area around the cities has been directed by Auckland transit, but they've been done very in a coordinated fashion and they each have their own policy, I showed you two different examples of their movement in place framework they actually ironically, like had reversed the direction of the movement in place framework, like hierarchy on their, their charts, which they chuckled about. So it's not perfect. It's not completely seamless, but they're all working at the same purpose. They're all saying, we are going to determine, we're going to have a, a, a set of high level policy goals, and then we're going to use a framework to decide where to emphasize what, so that we can all agree on it. And the way that the country of New Zealand does it with their non-metropolitan areas, if you will, their road controlling authorities, which are the local councils outside of those major metropolitan cities, is they say, here's what we think your existing movement in place is, and here's what we think, based on just what we know, your existing modal priorities are. Is that correct or not? And then the road controlling authorities, the local councils, provide feedback and say yes or no, and they tweak it. And then they've got their base case. And then they work collaboratively and they're in that process now of saying, well, what do we want those things to be? What do you want your movement in place corridors and your, your modal priority to be at a network scale and at sort of a sub, sub corridor or segment level so that we can have a plan and we'll do that collaboratively. I wanted to share um, along those points, a comment from someone joining us uh, very early in the morning from, uh, from New Zealand um, shared that that, that coordination from their perspective, this, with central government isn't isn't always perfect, as you say, it's not always flawless. But it um, there is widespread um, sort of use of an application of the one network framework, the road safety audit, and safe system framework, um, and that they say here has, has um, resulted or required a bit of upskilling uh, from the consultant side of the of the industry to really get uh, folks trained up. And I, I wonder if there are um, takeaways or lessons for implications for. What that means in the U.S. context. To what degree might, if we if we were to shift in this direction, thinking about um, workforce development, skills needed, and building those skills when people are in school that are training up to become the planners, the engineers who are going to be working on these projects. Did you come away with any takeaways on that training workforce development side of things? Yeah, that comment from Shane is is awesome because he's saying that 
the road safety audit process again not as sort of like a post-mortem like let's go out to the scene of the crash and see what happened and then fix it retroactively which is still important but saying like we are going to have a continuous process with a separate team of auditors i mean it's a road safety audit that kind of reverse value engineers rather than pulling stuff out it keeps stuff in the project as it goes from a policy into a planning process at a network scale into programming the projects into designing those projects and then building them and operating them and and testing and saying did we achieve what we wanted no okay let's tweak it and change it and go back into the process that loop that that laura showed at the beginning of the deck and having a third party that's trained both in the consultancy doing the design work and providing support to municipalities and within the government is really important and then also having that fluency within the government of what the different roles of the process are they had a lot of staff that had popped around that had like worked at Auckland Transport and then gone to work for the national agency, worked for a consulting firm, was in America, came back, you know, and so they had a lot of facility with the roles that the different parts of the transportation practitioner world provide. And I think that kind of um, familiarity with the different parts of the process allowed them to be more, understand how to be complementary, even though they would maybe have a narrow role. And then that overarching auditor role was really important for maintaining consistency and ensuring that the content, you know, didn't throw out the baby with the bathwater as the stuff moved from policy down through design into construction and operation. Yeah, the, there was a follow on question on the road safety audit topic, basically someone asking like, why haven't road safety audits really taken hold and, and become part of a standard approach in the United States? And I, I think there are some examples of where they have, and I, in our upcoming webinars, you'll hear about some of them, but um, Tamara Redmond, you offered a really great response to that person who asked the question. I think just highlighting that there are resources there, but the the emphasis here on on this study is really learning about how to do it in all phases of the project. If I understood correctly, yes. Cool. Yeah. Um, and that's and that, something that we hope to carry forward in the U.S. That was one of the recommendations that came out of the study report. So we'll be working on that in the near future. Excellent. So you'll hear more about that in the part, it'll be part three of this webinar series. Um, there were a couple of, a few design related or countermeasure treatment facility related questions that I wanted to get to. And um, the, a couple of them came to this issue of maintenance and that being, as someone puts it here, the recurring theme they hear is a barrier to improving conditions for vulnerable road users is, is the recurring cost to operate and maintain some of those improvements and, and maybe that's a reason why some agencies don't put things on the ground is because of the maintenance cost over time um any thoughts on what you learned from the scan relevance uh or at, uh, transferable elements that we could think about from the operation and maintenance side of what we end up putting on the ground um well I think most people know federal funds does do not cover maintenance costs. So I think, um, you know, as I said, you know, that's an issue. I don't recall. I think they had maintenance built in, if I'm not mistaken. I don't completely remember um, what the practices were around maintenance. I don't know if any of the other um, panelists do. But I've certainly heard that you know, even as far as pedestrian facilities go here, um, having to come up with, you know, a lot of times cities will um, burden homeowners with the cost of maintaining like sidewalks in front of their house and so forth. Um, so that's, that's obviously an issue. I think it's, there's that vicious cycle of auto oriented land use and transportation. And we have a system that doesn't, blink an eyelash or an eye about, you know, the, the obvious resurfacing of roads and maintaining of roads and, and measuring, um, you know, PCR on roads. And that is so built into the way you do transportation. It's, it's not questioned. And I think what we're seeing and what we've been hearing in the States from practitioners is the movement towards more parity between auto oriented transportation practice um, and multimodal transportation practice. And frankly, it all has to come along. I mean, you have to decide to make the investment to move enough people and goods out of 
single occupancy vehicles and into other modes to have a reason to prioritize the maintenance of the facilities for those modes. And it's a bit of a chicken and the egg. But if you start in the locations where you have the type of place that already can serve and is serving um, people outside of vehicles, um, accessing transit, walking, biking, and then build out from there, you know, you can begin to create more continuous networks that actually provide a realistic opportunity for people to use those other modes for their day-to-day -day activities. Not necessarily just their commute, um, you know, but all, all the other ways that people travel and then maintain and, you know, develop systems. We've seen a bunch of urban areas in the States prioritizing purchase of small format vehicles for plowing and, and sweeping protected or separated bike infrastructure and multi-use paths. It's just a decision that has to be made. And I think when you have enough, when you have enough constituents saying, Hey, you're sweeping the, the vehicle lane, but you're not sweeping the bike lane, then city council goes and, you know, acts and you start to see a, a more virtuous cycle of investment, but it, it's not, there's no silver bullet. Yeah, those are good points. Um, some questions about to, to what degree did you find that the Australian and New Zealand transportation networks, especially the pedestrian and bicycle networks, um, utilize uh, off-road shared use paths, multi-use trails, sort of beyond the standard right of way, using those types of facilities to help connect gaps or fill critical uh, connections in the network? Well, I, I think we saw we saw some uh, that were standalone um, off, off-road segments that were built. And then we also saw the analysis for network gaps and prioritizing those network gaps through whatever means were available um, that would fill that gap, very similar to what we're doing here. And then kind of doing a cost benefit analysis on um, how will that investment then uh, drive better access, uh, low cost transportation, fill in a big blank to the network. Are we filling it in in an equitable way and distributing it um, so that people can really truly make a choice to walk or bike? Uh, to get to these high place areas. Um, and I think you saw the example there. And uh, one of them even was uh, painted pink. It was almost a uh, uh, a tourist attraction in and of itself uh, that uh, was a standalone uh, above ground structure that uh, followed a on-ramp uh, into the city. Um, so it's it's fairly similar to what we're thinking about here and trying to fill in the gaps in the network. Yeah, Sherry, you mentioned the bike highway that we saw with mm -hmm. its own overpass to connect to the bike network that was um, more of the separated paths. I was very impressed to see the, the data tools um, that we talk about in the report and mega maps. They definitely have an inventory of footpaths that are off-road trail network paths you know, that is included in their planning and thinking about their true network, not just on street facilities. And I think that's also a big difference in terms of the data that we routinely collect and use to support decision making um, is it does not typically in the US include that full detail that we were seeing in New Zealand and Australia. See. There was a comment just that came in. It related to something you said about the pink path. This person saying that the pink path in Auckland was a disused motorway off ramp um, mm -hmm. originally. So that's a really neat um, idea of repurposing something that was already there uh, for a different, very different use. Um, I, while you're sitting on this slide, a few questions came up about just what were some of the design treatments that you saw used that you thought, oh my gosh, like that's very cool, and it and it actually would be just a very relevant and applicable to using in our context, but it may be something that we just don't usually see or use much of here. Was there anything that jumps to mind? Jonah covered a lot, but just in looking at the slide, I was surprised by the, um, the tools used at driveways to maintain the sidewalk and to slow turning movements. It was almost like traffic calming tools for driveway turns. And I think that's important given how many pedestrian and bicycle crashes occur because of turning movement conflicts. 
And they really paid a lot of attention to those junctions and to the speed at which you could encroach a driveway um, from turning. And also just the, by limiting the number of lanes, um, they, they had a lot of other policy tools that, that limited um, just the opportunity for some conflicts. Yeah, I was, I was kind of joking when we were talking with Mike Griffith before um, Tomer's old boss saying like, we're going to come back, you know, from this big study saying like, oh, the big thing we learned is vertical deflection, you know, <laughs> raise, raise the street four inches, big, big aha, but it works. I mean, and, and I remember I worked in the city of San Francisco and a, a traffic engineer there said when we were talking about this speed tables or speed humps, I want a driver's foot over the brake rather than over the gas when they're approaching a conflict zone. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. Toto, so, you had a just, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, Lee. I was going to say really quick that's not specifically a design element, but Laura made me think of it. And it was something I was super impressed with in Australia, which was we asked about what we would call left turn conflicts across path here in the US, where they turn left across a crosswalk waiting for a gap be right in Australia and they don't have them because they don't run the ped phases with the turning movement phases at their intersections downtown. This is in Sydney, which made it really pleasant to walk around as a pedestrian and really safe because you never really had to wor worry about left turns or right turns across your 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 crosswalk. And that's a ginormous change from how we think about turns and traffic flow in the US that would be a huge effect. It's not strictly design. It's just a whole new thought process, I guess, is what I'm looking forward to mm -hmm. consider. And I don't think, I mean, Austin, we're not there yet. I don't know when we'll be there, but it was definitely super impressive what it did to the entire multimodal realm. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and especially to observe it working, you know, and that the, the fear would be that it's never going to work, but it, but it's found, they found a way to make it work. It sounds like that's great. Um, I, I did want to jump. Strategies. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Jonah. Yeah. I was just going to say those operational strategies, it's hard to photograph. I got mm -hmm. lucky here with the street view, but, you know, like separating concurrent, having non concurrent phases, pedestrian scrambles or the barn stance. Um, rest on red is another technique where they just, at, at night, they have the signals in both directions be red until a vehicle pulls up and calls this, the signal so people can't be speeding towards a green light. I mean, every signal is red and they do it in a way that, you know, is in locations where they're not having a high volume of traffic. They need to keep moving through, but in areas where they're expecting pedestrian access or in a rural area um, where they happen to have a stop, a stoplight. And so some of that signal, the description of signals, again, doesn't show up as photographs or graphics, but is, is written up in the report. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to jump to some speed management uh, questions that came in. I'm uh, understanding that we're going to have a whole session on this later, but and in general, um, on the speed ca cameras uh, side of things, a um, person was asking, do, do motorists really accept speed cameras in New Zealand and Australia, and how has this been achieved? Because it seems so, you know, maybe pie in the sky for some of us to imagine that this is a widespread and accepted um, strategy to use. But could you speak to the maybe more cultural acceptance um, of of such a strategy? Um, they had, they use cameras for several things besides, you know, speed mm -hmm. cameras and um, red light running cameras. They also had cameras that detected cell phone use. They had cameras that detected um, seat belt use. Um, so th the takeaway that I had was just, it's just more accepted that, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a good way to put this, that you're that maybe the government is doing, you know, something good for your safety and um, more than so than it is here in the United States. Um, and they also did um, just random drug testing as well. So they would, I think they averaged pulling each driver over at least one, one and a half times a year or something like that. So for no cause, just to pull them over and do drug testing or um, so that I don't think would go over very well here, but I just think that the culture is more accepting um, of those things, you know, in return for their safety. Yeah, thank you for that. 
There was a question here, and I, I we'll be getting back to some of the speed management, speed camera topics uh, with that with the next session that we hold later in the series. Uh, this one, though, I, I I forgot to ask. Come back and ask this question. In general, kind of looking at comparing Australasia with the United States, how do the vehicle motor vehicle sizes typically compare? If you look at sort of the fleet overall, we've obviously in the U.S. seen um, an increasing role of larger vehicles, uh, SUVs, and heavier vehicles involved in pedestrian um, crashes and pedestrian deaths, and as well as bicycling. I, I wonder to what degree the vehicle makeup, the general typical vehicle is the same or maybe different um, there versus here. Or if that was examined as part of the study. It wasn't no, examined. Showing, yeah. yeah, I recall them being relatively similar. I mean, in, in Europe, certainly you see, you know, very small vehicles and particularly like maintenance vehicles, little vans, um, smaller format um, emergency response vehicles. I, I would say the fleet was more similar to this that we see in the States here in Auckland or Australia, New Zealand. I certainly saw a lot of buses and double-decker buses and freight vehicles um, on the corridor. And unlike Europe, not nearly as many mopeds or micromobility devices hmm. um, as we might have expected. That Laura, you hinted another question I wanted to bring up, which is um, the role of transit in in these places that you that you visited. Obviously, we're seeing images throughout about of you know lots of bus stops, um, bus lanes. Uh, is is transit a large portion of the connection to transit and considering uh, transit operations in the arterial, you know, transferability of some of these lessons to our arterials? Uh, tra transit seems fairly common. Is that big part of the um, the recommendations within the the report about how to bring some of this into the U.S. context? Uh, kind of looking at that transit connection. Absolutely, and that's something we even heard from New South Wales. They merged and reorganized their entire um, agency because they recognized that they had a transit division that had been operating sort of in silo, and in some cases, you know, creating tension with other surface planning and surface modal transportation activities. And so they actually merged so that transit could be a central part of the discussion in terms of their network and priorities and uh, design. And I feel like we saw that in, in New Zealand as well, that transit was very central to the policy approach to address issues around climate and equitable access and mode shift as well as safety. I mean, we, we even saw in Auckland where they were starting to move the parking garages out to the perimeter of the central business district so that um, you really created these mobility hubs around the edge of the city and then you would only be having the transit come in and they allowed cars and persons who needed transport for disability needs uh, in as well, obviously. Um, but that that was pretty interesting. And then they could start re reusing all of that land use for more people-oriented housing and cultural facilities and other things, rather than taking up the space for parking in the in the high use, high place, high pedestrian zones in a central business district. Great. Um, well, so we're nearing the end of our first episode in this series. We have three more to come. Uh, I wanted to ask you, the panelists, if you, if there are folks attending this webinar thinking about that, who they might want to bring with them from their transportation agency next time and get them signed up for the remainder of the series, who do you think might not be here that should kind of be at the table, who should uh, uh, receive some of this information and maybe work it into their work? Any Anyone come to mind? But, you know, I, I saw some comments in the questions about, um, you know, we don't want to paint too idealistic of a outcome here about everyone gets along perfectly, right? There's there's classic still uh, learning curves and coordination between local, state, and their federal, between the different disciplines, but they've got a structure to to institutionalize and overcome that. So I think the people that the greatest diversity of people that we can bring into this conversation to hear it and then go back and have those 
collaborative interdisciplinary conversations, um, you know, creates a pathway for us to have more conversations and more applicability in the US. So it's not all uh, rainbows and unicorns everywhere. <laughs> There, you have to work at it at the people in the organizational level, and they are working at it. And I think this isn't just for pedestrian and bicycle professionals. I mean, it's it's critically important that everybody else, leadership, folks in operations, folks doing signal design, get involved too and understand how they can use their skills to move goods and people, not just vehicles, safely in a way that achieves, you know, benefits for climate and for equity and for economics. Well, that's a great place to leave it. Um, we're going to continue the conversation next Monday with a more of a deep focus on the movement in place framework. Um, I'd encourage you all to double check, see if you're registered for the remaining episodes. Please register if you, if you aren't. You'll get an email later today with uh, some information about the webinar archive, how to register for the upcoming episodes and how to complete a post webinar evaluation to receive a certificate of attendance for this webinar today. Um, but I just want to say thanks to all of you for joining us. Thanks to our panel. Uh, we'll see everyone hopefully back a week from today to continue the, the series. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.